Hi, everybody. I think we're going to get started. Can you hear me okay? All right. Welcome to the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at WSU. I'm Kristen Becker, the Curator of Education and Programs here at the museum. We're always really pleased and we feel privileged to be able to work with the Visiting Writer Series to host writers reading in the museum. Um, we also are super grateful for all our Department of English faculty who bring their classes and find inspiration and teach their students using our exhibition. So thanks to all of you uh, for being here tonight. Um, we do have three new exhibitions at the museum that just opened last week. So I'd just like to kind of make note of those really briefly. The first one is Beyond Hope, Keenholz and the Inland Northwest. And that show starts out in this pavilion gallery that we're sitting in. The artists Edward and Nancy Keenholz were connected to the Inland Northwest, um, the Hope, Idaho area towards kind of the later decades of their career. So this show is about the time that they were working in the panhandle of Idaho. And then we also have a show titled Subversive Intent that is selections from our permanent collection. And so that is meant to be kind of a conversation or a dialogue with the Keenholz show in terms of social and political commentary that was so important to the Keenholzes as artists. And then we have our Masters of Fine Arts thesis exhibition in the back gallery two graduating MFAs from our three-year program here in the art department, Mosey Jones and Reka Okuhara. Um, one of my favorite things about hosting writers in the museum and performers is that even when it's maybe unintentional or indirect, what they read here, what they say here, uh, oftentimes resonates with the artwork. And the work in these exhibitions does have a lot of text. It has a lot of writing that is both verbal and visual. So I, I hope that maybe after the reading you go take a peek or come back and visit us on another day when we're open and think about how the exhibitions might connect with what you hear tonight from our visiting writer. So I'd like to welcome Cameron McGill to kick off our visiting writer series tonight. Thank you so much. I don't know, yeah, that's on, yeah? Okay, what else should I knock over before we start here? My goodness. Uh, thanks, Kristen, thanks for having us here. Um, good evening, afternoon, it's very light out now, it's still good. Uh, my name is Cameron McGill. Um, on behalf of myself and uh, my Visiting Writer Series co-director, Julian Ankney, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight, and to those online, thank you for joining us uh, as we welcome poet and author and editor Gabrielle Calvacaresi. Washington State University Pullman is located on the homelands of the Nimipu and the traditional homelands of the Palutes Band of Indigenous People. We acknowledge their presence here since time immemorial and recognize their continuing connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. We view the land acknowledgement as a first but necessary step in our work to serve and honor our communities and land grant mission. The Visiting Writers Series is committed to honoring this acknowledgement by bringing to campus diverse groups of writers working at the top of their fields whose voices, identities, stories, and perspectives enrich our communities, the minds and lives of our students and our university as a whole. Uh, our events this semester and, and every semester are made possible by many hearts and minds uh, a partnership between WSU Pullman and Vancouver English Department, WSU's College of Arts and Sciences, Land Escapes, Native American Programs, WSU Vancouver's Council on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, <laughs> uh, for letting us back in every time, um, Academic Outreach and Innovation, for, for making the sound and live stream happen, thank you so much, and WSU's Common Reading Program, um, Reading, a common reading credit will be available after uh, the event via Karen Weatherman. Thank you, Karen. Um, for those online, there will be a link posted in the chat, um, and we appreciate your continued partnership and common reading support of the series. So, uh, yes, I'm glad you're here. It's nice to see you. I see many students, people I met earlier today, 
It's good to see you. Uh, I first met Gabrielle, um, well, earlier today. Uh, we go pretty far back. Um, and, uh, but I've known and valued their work for uh, nearly a decade. Um, Apocalyptic Swing was one of the first books assigned in uh, Alexandra Teague's Poetry Techniques class at University of Idaho's MFA program in 2015. Um, it was and remains a gift. Uh, these are poems of tough beauty and grit, uh, musicality of tenderness and becoming, of queer youth and love, of music, the strictures of religion, and the gift and curse of place. This from the poem, Prayer After a Long Time Away. All that vinyl and the cheap needle that skimmed along the top as I pursed my lips, tried to show restraint when all I wanted was to sound across the town that bore me so much ill will. I tell you, I'm ashamed to have held my breath so long, to have said I give up, over and over when I could have made a joyful noise instead. Were you the songs or the silences between them? The rustle I took for nothingness. We are very lucky this evening, both for the poet and their work, uh, and to finish uh, a series of introductions, uh, as we are wont to do. I welcome our visiting writer series uh, intern, Callan Hibbets. Hello, is that, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for being with us here tonight, both attending and online and in person. Um, my name is Callan. I am this semester's intern for the WSU Visiting Writer Series, and I have the honor of welcoming today's visiting writer, Gabrielle Cavill Cressy. Um, this has been a particularly exciting event for me because we're actually currently reading some of their work in my English 352 class. So to go from like reading, reading their poetry to introducing them to talk to us here is like kind of crazy. Uh, for those who don't know, Calvo Cressy is an author, poet, editor, and teacher who has won many accolades for their contributions to literature. I'll let the bio speak for itself. Uh, they are the author of The Last Time I Saw Amelia Earhart, Apocalyptic Swing, which was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize, and Rocket Fantastic, which was a winner of the Audre Lorde Award for Lesbian Poetry. Uh, Calvo Cressy is a recipient of numerous awards and fellowship, including a Stegner Fellowship and Jones Lectureship from Stanford University, a Rona Joff Woman Writers Award, a Lannan Foundation residency in Marfa, Texas, the Bernard F. Connors Prize from the Paris Review, and a residency from the Civitella Renieri Foundation, among others. Cavill Cressy's poems have been published or are forthcoming in numerous magazines and journals, including The Baffler, The New York Times, Poetry, Boston Review, Kenyon Review, Ten House, and The New Yorker. Cavill Cressy is an editor at large at Los Angeles Review of Books and poetry editor at Southern Culture Cultures. Works in progress include a nonfictional book entitled The Year I Didn't Kill Myself and a novel, The Alderman of the Graveyard. Calvo Cressy teaches at UNC Chapel Hill and lives in Old East Durham, North Carolina, where joy, compassion, and social justice are at the center of their personal and poetic practice. Calvo Cressy was the Beatrice Shepherd Blaine Fellow at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute for 2022 to 2023. Without further ado, please extend a warm cougar welcome to our guest, the Visiting Writer Series, Gabrielle Calvo Cressy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Wow, you're sitting facing the wall, and then you turn around, and there's all this beauty. Hello. I mean, the museum's pretty good, but you all, amazing. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah? All right, I'm going to get some water. Where is the water? Oh, it's here. No, it's perfect. Um, I want to thank um, Cam. I want to thank Callum. I want to thank everyone who's here and all the students I've met so far, um, and everyone who's out there. 
there's a whole bunch of schools, right? Like there's all sorts of other partners for this and this visit, and I really, really appreciate it. It's great to be back here. Um, the last time I was here was when I saw Alexander Teague, and I got to be in Moscow, Idaho. So it's just, um, this is a place that I really love, and I, I feel really, really blessed. And we had such good conversations today um, in the class that I visited. Um, Colin, just like, what an absolute inspiration of a teacher, and just all ready to know all these connections we all have. Um, I never do this. Well, I mean, I read poems a lot. <laughs> but no, I never do that. Uh, but th this book, Rocket Fantastic, I'm I have a, working on a new book. But um, I know that students have been reading um, Rocket Fantastic. And it's interesting thinking, I also want to thank everyone at the museum. And when you were saying, oh, there's usually a conversation between the art and the work. I walked through those beautiful galleries and I just thought like vessel after vessel after vessel trying to make itself clear or scrutable or to allow its complete inability to be known to glimmer forth. And that is something that this book really tried to do um, as it is also something I think my body has tried to do, my life and my body has tried to do. There are a series of um, poems in this book uh, where there's a figure um, called the band leader and the, the gendered pronoun is just a symbol and the idea is that um, instead of he, she, they, all valuable terms, um, there's a symbol that just says like, well, what if, what if it's, you just breathe it in? What if you, it's just a sound? And part of the reason I did that was who am I on any given day? I don't know. I walk in that gallery and I think, like, what's my vessel? What's it trying to do? I don't know. And so when I read these aloud, um, there's like I, I make a sort of sound for the symbol. And I often don't read them aloud. Uh, or if I do, I need to feel really comfortable. Or I need to know already that I feel pretty uncomfortable and do that. But today, in the class, um, a wonderful student asked me about these poems and said, could you read one? Um, and, because I want to hear that sound. And I read it, and then I said, it'll probably sound different tonight if I read it at the reading. But I thought to myself, oh, I don't know that I'll read it at the reading, or I'll read it later at the reading. Why not just jump in and read it right now? And uh, this can be a way we get to know each other. <gasps> huge. Standing there in the woods where I didn't even see who's at first oh, doesn't know I'm looking, oh, moves a little bit and kicks the ground. I was walking by myself as the sun set. I kept going in deeper to the greenest spot until I found a clearing. Oh, was the clearing. Oh, took up the clearing and stood there still and watched me till I saw whose, I saw whose shoulders first and then whose neck I think oh, was so golden in the sun I didn't know what oh, was and I thought the branches were whose horns I thought oh, was an eight point stag and how whose chest made a kind of giant heart out of me out of my eyes looking and oh, let me look oh, stood there in the green not moving I thought whose horns were leaves I saw eight branches coming from whose head oh, didn't stop my looking oh, didn't turn away I watched the whole of whose I saw whose arms and the taper of whose legs oh, let me watch for maybe hours, but really moments like a gift. Like when you're almost home and smell them cooking summer supper, but you're still outside and could just turn back around. We stood like that together. Oh, let me touch the whole of whose every rise and muscle. Oh, let me rest on the hollow of whose neck and breathe it in for four whole breaths. Oh, said my name or oh, shook whose head inside the leaves 
and sighed and let the light come into us. Oh, let the light hold us for a while. Wow, that's the most intimate thing I've done in a while. <laughs> ah. I'm going to check the clock because when I um, was at the class earlier today, I ran them over by so long because I was like, let's keep talking. Yeah, it's good to make your noise, you know? Like, what would everybody's noise be in this room right now? Praise House, the new economy. This is um, after and for my dear friend, Ross Gay. Praise House, the new economy. The rosemary bush blooming its unabashed blue. Also, dumplings filmed with steam and soap, so my mouth fills and I bubble over with laughter. Little things, people kissing on bicycles, being able to walk up the stairs and run back down. Joanna's garden after the long flight to Tel Aviv, not being detained like everyone thought I would. The man with dreadlocks and a perfect green shirt walking home from work, one cold beer before I drink it and get sick. How peaches mold into compost in a single day, orange to gray, darkness into dirt. Her ankles taste, the skin right under the knob, delicate as a tomatillo's shroud. All the animals that talk to me, that I finally let them talk to me, the blessing of waking early enough to watch the fox bathe itself, the suction of a man's hands meeting another's on the street, every single person looking up to see them. Rose, yes, but lovely in the golden light with brims swung to the back. I want shoulders like they have, want my waist to taper to an ass built like the David's, I admit it. This body's not enough for me. Still, I love it. I'll be sure, blasting out a Nissan Sentra's windows, bow ties, ridiculous blues, my mother's seizures, specifically that I don't have them, that I can answer Ross's call or not, because we live harmonious and are always talking somehow. Tapestries with their gluttony of deer, fig perfume, and also cypress boxer briefs, and packing socks in jockey shorts, strap-ons, soft and hard, welcome in her hand and in mine as I greet the real me. That little shop in Provincetown and the speckled dog that licks itself in that fresco of the crucifixion. Mary Oliver, I love her. I really do. <laughs> the baseball she gave me that says, go Sox, though I love the Orioles, Old Bay on all my shrimp and justice and sittings burning if people need to burn them to get free. My grandmother gardening in the late light, Sun Ra, the first time, Paris, even though I've never been there, natal plums, Tattoos everlasting, clouds, Orion's belt pushing inside her with both hands holding myself up, my weight, her grabbing and saying, God, fuck the neighbors, Casablanca, not knowing anything, angels, mashed potatoes, good red wine. Oh. Mary Oliver, I love her, I really do. And now she's gone. When I wrote that poem, she wasn't gone yet. But we've lost so many people, you know. I mean, before I came here, or when I came here, there hadn't been a global pandemic yet. Although I grew up in the guts of the AIDS crisis, and so death and death and death, and we see it all the time. We miss everyone. <clears throat> I miss everyone. And then people had, during COVID, 
the, the height of COVID, we are still in the depths of COVID in many ways. Um, I don't know if people had this experience. We lost so many friends who didn't die of COVID during COVID. Like how did anyone, and, and I thought, wait, you can die of things other than COVID right now? And right, how dare you? I lost my great friend, the wonderful Kiowa scholar and artist, uh, Jenny Tonpohot. And I just thought, could I make these poems, these, and they're, they're, the refrain is miss you, miss you, miss you. Oh, could we do it? People are like, I did not come here for this. But could we just like, could you just, can we just say like six times, miss you? Miss you, miss you, miss you, miss you, miss you, miss you. Oh, it's starting. It's opening. I thought, could we open the portal? Miss you. Would like to grab that chilled tofu that we love. Do not care if you only bring your light body. Would just be so happy to sit at the table and talk about the menu. Miss you. Wish we could bet which chilies they'll put on the cubes of tofu, our favorite, sometimes green, sometimes red. Roasted, we always thought, but so cold and fresh. How did they do it? Wish you could be here to talk about it, like it was so important. Wish you could. Watched you on the screens as I was walking, as I was cooking. Wished you could get out of the hospital. Can't bring myself to order our dish and eat it in the car. Miss you laughing. Miss you coming in from the cold and one too many meetings, laughing. I'll order already. I'll order seven helpings, some dumplings, those cold yam noodles that you like. You can come in your light body or skeleton or be invisible. I don't even care. No, you have a long way to travel. No, I don't even know if it's long at all. Wish you could tell me what you're reading. If you're reading, miss you. I'm at the table in the back. all our beings. If you went home tonight and you just like wrote a miss you poem for someone or something and we all just did it and then like maybe the portal would open. It's not even like I want them to come back because who knows, maybe where they are is awesome. I don't know. But like wouldn't it be nice just to open the portal and we all just like shimmer together for a minute. Like I would just, if I could just like stand near my grandmother for a second it probably wouldn't be enough, but I'd take it. Mm. It's beautiful here. Look at the light. The sun got all over everything. Over the boys and girls by the pool. Over the bougainvillea, which got so hot, my palms stayed warm for minutes after. It made a mess of a day that was supposed to be the worst and lured me outside so I forgot her death entirely. And also the polar bears scrambling on the ice chips and also that there was no water in the Golden State. The pool was full and the sun poured across the women's bodies so you had to shade your eyes, or I did. I had to put my hand up to see what they were saying. I know it's no excuse, and I had made a plan to cry all day and into the evening. I marked it in my book, which seems like something I'd make up in a poem, except this time I actually did it. I wrote, grieve, because we're all so busy, aren't we? And so broke. I needed to make an appointment with my anguish so I could take my mind off buying groceries that I really couldn't afford. Anyway, I didn't mean to go outside, except there the sky was, just ridiculously blue, taunting me with pigment that I felt the need to name. 
And from somewhere close by, a voice I couldn't see because the sun was like a yoke cracked over it said, what are you drinking? And I said, I'm grieving. I'm very busy remembering. I made an appointment because last year I forgot and then felt awful. The sun opened its mouth and made a gong of the canyons. It poured across the girls and slicked across their Dior lenses. I put my tongue on it, exactly when I should have been tearing at my clothes and lighting candles. I got on top and let it find the tightness in my back and open where my wings would be. Somewhere, my mother was dying and someone was skinning a giraffe and I let it go. I just let it go. There's a, um, I'm so aware all the time of like what it is to just be surrounded um, by beautiful light, what luck it is to walk by these plants that are blooming, and to have friends. Um, there's a great book by the uh, anthology, the poet laureate Ada Limon has um, an anthology called You Are Here that's come out that's very much about this idea of the natural world and being part of it. And uh, the book came out yesterday, and um, I have a poem in it. And this is, uh, it's called An Inn for the Coven. And I have, like, we, many of us have, like, a group chat. And uh, my, little, my little hive group chat is uh, the, my, the poet Jennifer Chang and Oliver Bayes Bendorf and Jenny Johnson. What a great little coven. Let me tell you something. We talk a lot about food. We have photos of funny animals. But we do the real stuff. That's real stuff, too. This is called an in for the coven. Witch hazel going wild along the walkway, and all the spots to sit and read our spell books, and all the ways to keep the out. Two black cats and a beaver who eats carrots all day, every room and upper room, even on the ground floor, and bee boxes in the way back, and the sweet man who comes to keep them. All our loves are witches too, or warlocks, all our children and our children, welcome. Water running in the brook, clean enough to drink from our hands, and seven sources in a deep well, all for us and all for those we bring over. Four swings in the branches, a library in every hollow, and birds, so many birds we stop trying to name them. We'll just let them be with their own names. Maybe they'll tell us. Porches, tomato in the summer and pumpkins in the fall, and curry leaves and curry blossoms, jasmine in the rooms all night, all loves protected, all of us playing cribbage on the lawn. <laughs> Miss you. Would like to take a walk with you. Do not care if you just arrive in your skeleton. Would love to take a walk with you. Miss you. Would love to make you shrimp saganaki like you used to make me when you were alive. Love to feed you. Sit over steaming bowls of pilaf, little roasted tomatoes covered in pepper and nutmeg. Miss you. Would love to walk to the post office with you. Bring the ghost dog. We'll walk past the waterfall, and you can tell me about the after. Wish you, wish you would come back for a while. Don't even need to bring your skin sack. I'll know you. I know you'll know me, even though I'm bigger now, grayer. I'll show you my garden. I'd like to hop in the leaf pile you raked, but if you want to jump in, I'll rake it for you. Miss you. Standing, looking out over the river with your rake in your hand. Miss you in your puffy blue jacket. They're hip now. I can bring you a new one if you'll only come by. No, I told you it was okay to go. No, I told you it was okay to leave me. Why'd you believe me? You always believed me. Wish you would come back so we could talk about truth. Miss you. 
wish you would walk through my door, stare out from the mirror, come through the pipes. I do this thing when I give a reading where every single person, I just put a ghost beside them. Do you feel them? I put a little ghost, like just like someone I miss. There are a lot of people at this reading, living and not. And I'm thrilled that you're all here. Is it time for a fairy tale? Yeah? Like a sort of long fairy tale? People were asking, they were like, man, I only have so much time left in this life. Um, People were asking about, uh, in my poems uh, at the last class, talking about patterns and talking about story. And um, I said I wanted the book to be this, this book to be a sort of giant tapestry. Four long years at court. I really miss the forest and how I used to hide there with the queen. I miss how we used to dance and how we'd run from court. I miss the buttons, oh, her buttons, how they'd shine in the late light when she wasn't looking at me, arriving in the thicket where she'd somehow gotten first. I wish she'd step down for the first time again to greet me in the great hall where all the beasts' heads hovered, all the torches lit her from within. I was looking at the bat cup the bucks rack swinging in the firelight like a lantern. I saw its bones, saw the fingers hook onto the antler. There she was, beside me, watching me not see her. You look to your right and time becomes a torch blown huge. It was like that. The bat looked like an otter's stomach blown into a lamp. I told her so, the way you will. If I had turned away toward the ladies dancing, toward the door and walked out to the courtyard, toward the axes lined in rows and clean, I miss how we'd walk into the clearings and the caves. The deer walked up from the ravines and stared. I wasn't scared of them or me even with the things I'd done, not when she was there. I was so enamored of the bat swinging. I could see its body through the thin shroud of its wings. I thought I could kill it with one hand. There she was, watching me think it, watching me shake the thought of other things into the darkness of the hall. She touched my shoulder. Did I sing? Sometimes to myself, sitting by the river or in the night to keep me safe. Sometimes my name softly to myself to remind me. Once beside my mother who'd swelled to the size of a sheep. The deer is in the thicket. The fox is in the glade. Like that till she stopped breathing, and after, as I watched the women wash her, not scared anymore, neither one of us, I told her so. How I sang of the fox and the deer, she held me in the clearing, we could see the towers from there. It feels so long ago, and also like yesterday, stepped down from her throne, and then together in the forest, that fast, and also through the hours beside the king, turn towards me. I think it as she sat, turn. All the beasts' heads waiting, the boar's mouths open, the lynx with its pink tongue, the deer, the deer, the deer, one after another on the walls, the hinds and hearts, the ten-point stag I took down as a mercy after the king missed its chest seven times. I killed him as he tried to crawl away. I sang, stop, sang, the deer's in the thicket as his eyes rolled, the fox is in the glade. I took his antler in my left hand and pulled back, hey, lolly, lolly, pulled back until he groaned. I miss the moment before it started, the body just a figment, the deer nothing but a song I sang beside my mother as she died. It can take forever 
You can make a life up in the time it takes to watch your mother die. I was in the glade. No, I was in the bedroom. No, I was nowhere in the story. Was nowhere to be found. I want her back. I want the castle and the bat. I even want the stag who couldn't make up his mind if he should die or not. If he should let me pull his neck back or not. Get loose and double. I'd sing alone in my room or on the train or as I walked to work. The world around a tapestry. I'd cock my head, I'd see the stag. I'd cock my head, I'd see the men in business suits. I miss the queen. I want her here beside me. The null points like a glade where she'd lay me down beside the stream. The Beatles' armies resting on the rocks, the towers in the distance. Your friends are with you, then they're gone. Your mother is with you, then she's gone. My armor shone all morning. By nightfall, it was blood and ash. Hey, lolly, lolly. The fox is in the glade. The debt collector's in the cans of soup. One minute you're a castle, the next you're just a cloud. Turn around. Turn around in the late light. If I cock my head, I see the armies. I could have walked from court and just kept going. Did I sing? As the fox or the stag with his neck pulled back. I want it back. Should we have a slightly funnier fox poem? That might be. Oh, but what about this? My partner, Angeline, is not here tonight. For some reason, she did not want to fly through the night and get in at 3 in the morning and then sit in a hotel room while I talked about poems all day. Monster. She's the greatest. And uh, I have a poem called She Ties My Bow Tie, which she is quick to point out. I always say this. She will say, I do not tie your bow tie. I fix your bow tie. And then I'm like, what kind of a poem is called I fix your bow tie? Let me just read that for you. She fixes my bow tie. No, there's nothing there. But she ties my bow tie, and she does. This is for Angeline, who's back at home. She ties my bow tie. What you thought was the sound of the deer drinking at the base of the ravine was not their soft tongues entering the water, but my love tying my bow tie. We were in our little house just up from the ravine. Forgive yourself. It's easy to mistake her wrists for the necks of deer. Her fingers move so deftly, one could call them skittish, though not really, because they aren't afraid of you. I know, you thought it was the deer, but they're so far down, you couldn't possibly hear them. No, this is the breeze my love makes when she ties me up and sends me out into the world. Her breath pulled taut and held until she's through. I watch her in the mirror not even looking at me. She's so focused on the knot and how to loop the silk into a bow. Thanks, Angeline. Even when that she's not there, I call and I just like hold the phone up and I'm like, how's it going? We have a little thing. She either will be like, great, or she'll go clown school. Turn around, go. Clown school when I decide to wear like some wild pattern thing that like almost works but does go over a kind of line. But often I still wear it. <laughs> this is called I Was Popular in Certain Circles, which is, it takes its um, title from the first sentence of a story by the writer Grace Paley. Ooh, Grace Paley. If Grace Paley's ghost was here, that would be great. She probably has better things to do, but than to be here with me. Oh no, she's right here. Hi. Okay. Um, I was popular in certain circles. 
among the river rats and the leaves, for example. I was huge among the lichen, and the waterfall couldn't get enough of me. And the gravestones, I was hugely popular with the gravestones, also with the meat liquefying beneath. I'd say to the carrion birds, I'd say, are you an eagle? I can't see so well. That made us laugh until we were screaming, eagle, imagine. The vultures loved me so much, they'd feed me the first morsel from their delicate talons, which is what I called them, such delicate talons. They loved me so deeply, they'd visit in pairs, one to feed me, one to cover my eyes with its velvety wings which were heavy as theater curtains, which I was sure to remark on. Why can't I see what I'm eating, I'd say. And the wings would pull me into the great bird's chest, and I'd feel the nail inside my mouth. What pals I was with the scavengers and the dead things too, what pals? As for the living, the fox would not be outdone. We'd sit on the cliff's edge and watch the river like a movie, and I'd say, I think last night. And the fox would his, put his paw on top of mine and say, forget it, it's done. I mean, we had fun. You haven't lived until a fox has whispered something the ferns told him in your one good ear. I mean, truly, you have not lived. People will be like, is there really a fox? I'm like, of course there's a fox. <laughs> I guess it's time to go, because we're going to have all kinds of Q&A. Um, read one last poem. Just, um, I had a, uh, I gave myself a little job last, privilege, all kinds of things. I was trying to figure out what to give up for Lent. And I, last year, not this year, last year, sort of this year, but, and I thought, well, I will give up chocolate, which is really difficult for me. And then I thought, how about instead of giving up chocolate, I give up self-loathing. And, I, and I, by, I do that by trying to write a poem a day for every day of Lent. It was hard because I am someone who often is like, I'm not a poet, I'm terrible at that, you know, like, and yet here I am. So um, I wrote a bunch of, I wrote a poem every day for Lent and then, my my this year when Lent ends, I can begin revising these poems. But um, Good Friday. All your friends assemble. The cats curled on laps as you sit at the table. All the dogs get all the prime rib they want. No scraps for anyone because there are no scraps. Just heaping portions and everyone has their fill. All the clocks stop. The lights strung over the feast are actually stars. Everyone's made it through our Saturn returns like champions. Pour the nectar into the goblets, lift your hand for the toast, put your shoulder into it. In the distance you see the trees, and past that you see the hilltop. No one else is looking. They're wiping saganaki off each other's chins. They're kissing baklava from a stranger's lips. Honey never tasted so good. A little buckwheat in it, a little borage. The poison ivy the bee found on its way home. In your ears, the buzzing as you look into the distance. Head like a hive, look away. Feel your friend's hands on your shoulders, sleepy drunk. They're leaning on you, saying something about some other night you all had together. Someone took a goat and cooked it in the ground. From somewhere, a guitar, girls laughing or boys laughing. Why did you ever care who was who? The point is they're laughing. In the distance, the hilltop looks lit from behind, but it's not close to morning. It couldn't be. All your friends assembled at the table that you built with your dad how he held his hand over yours as you tapped the hammer. He smelled like cedar, his beard tickling your cheek. I feel so alone 
when someone's just offered you figs, some cheese, has placed their hand on the back of your neck, has turned your chin away from the view in the distance. Be here right now, they say, leaning in to kiss your mouth. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hey everyone online, what I said was <laughs> we're going to do a slightly different Q&A tonight and I'm going to ask you all questions. <laughs> the chat is blowing up right now. They love that idea. <laughs> Either that or it's just like silence. Um, uh, but I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, maybe I'll sit on this. If um, you have a question, I'll bring this to yeah, you. I'm happy to answer any question about anything. Can you hear me if I'm sitting here like this? Yeah? OK, that's enough mic. Yeah. Hi, I'm Gabby. I'm Peter. Hi, Peter. I don't want to trigger any deep Catholic stuff, but. Um, that's OK. I'm like one big, I'm just one giant religious trigger. I like the Lent, <laughs> for myself. The Lent poem. I was just wondering if you could say more about writing about Lent and why yeah. that's important to you. Yeah, I was talking about this a little bit in class today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm someone who, like, since I can remember, has prayed, just like many times a day. Um, and in a lot of ways, that was because when I was very young, I was really lonely. I didn't, and there were things happening in my life and in my home that I didn't really have any understanding of how to find language for and how to talk to someone about. And so I grew up in a family where like my grandmother went to church. I lived with my grandparents. They prayed. My grandfather did not. My grandmother did. Um, and so God seemed like this figure I could speak to, that energy, that back and forth. At the same time, my mother uh, was profoundly mentally ill, uh, being just worked into the ground by being a mentally ill, impoverished person in the Reagan era in a rural place. And um, she was profoundly religious. And she, um, the way religion worked in her life was terrifying to me. She was, it, it seemed to um, fill her with shame, terror, hope that was obliterated um, all the time. And I really like lived in this balance. And then I moved from the home of my grandparents. My grandmother was just went to a small Episcopal church, and like faith was kind of what you did all week, taking people to vote, doing these kinds of things. Um, and I moved in with my father and my stepmother, who were like, who were at that point like very devout atheists. I wasn't allowed to pray in the house. I wasn't allowed to do any of that stuff. It was like there were so many closets I lived in, and that was one of them. But because life is fascinating and sort of hilarious, they also sent me to Catholic school, right? So, <laughs> and they told the nuns I couldn't pray. <laughs> you know what nuns love? <laughs> is when a little kid comes to them and says, my family says I can't pray, but I must be allowed to pray. They love that. Um, so, I, I grew up, in all kinds of different religious spaces and feeling both inside of them and outside of them. And then I had this kind of private world of prayer that was the one that felt most fulfilling to me. I think I've spent my whole life looking for a church that I could go to for the rest of my life and I've never found it. You know, I found spaces. I love to be, I like to sit zaza and I like to be with people and, and, and be in spiritual space together. Um, but I had, not, I had not done Lent, practiced Lent, been part of Lent for a very long time until last year I was in, um, I was in, Mass I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts for the year. And I grew up in New England. And all of a sudden, 
I was in uh, Cambridge. I was I was at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, and there was like an well, there's an Episcopal church every two seconds in in Boston, but like there was, a, but it was right nearby. I could see the steeple from my office, and I felt very drawn to try, you know, to like try and to think about like what what that time could mean to me as a person who I'd been quite ill. Um, I I was uh, had a I had things going on with my body. Um, I, I, I say this openly because I think it's worth people hearing, especially people in trans bodies like this one. Um, I, uh, I'm 49 years old. I was 48 at the time. Uh, I had bled almost every single day um, for over a year. Um, I was really having a lot of difficulty um, gynecologically and just in my vessel, and that was doing all kinds of things to me. I had had surgery. Like, what was I going to, why was I drawn to Lent? What was I going to give up? Chocolate. I won't go to the movies. And then I was like, all of these things are involved with appetite and capitalism for me. Like, what is that time actually about? And if I'm going to go into the vessel of something like Lent, and I say this, like, this is just my practice, just my, um, if I'm going to go deep into that practice of Lent, which I do also think is a practice of gratitude, like, my grandmother lived it like that, sort of removal and also regeneration. What would that mean for me? And I thought, you know, the thing that I both like love more than almost anything, but that I also keep myself from doing because I punish myself in certain ways, um, has to do actually with writing poems and making art and having faith in myself. And so I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take these days, I'm gonna go to the church each day, I'm gonna have my practice, and I am going to, I'm going to give up the thing that is both very painful for me to give up and also quite damaging to me. And I'm going to see if these days can, I can regenerate, I can generate in some way. Um, it, was, it was very powerful to me. It was also because of that, I thought of my mom every day during that time. Um, and I thought of my grandmother every day. And I have no idea, like, I realized also that when I was young, I don't know, I don't know if you, if Lent is something that you think about a lot or that you, like, I also realized how, how when I was younger it was so much about doing Lent right or wrong. And that was also how I treat poems in a way. And so it just became a larger practice for me. And I did a variation of that this year. Um, interestingly, I realized that next year I would not, it doesn't, it's actually not as, I don't know if effective is the right word to do it each year the same way because I, it becomes like chocolate. Like it's, right? Like it, I started doing it and I was like, well, now it's just giving up chocolate. Does that make sense? So it teaches me my, my, um, my practice and my faith and my questioning teaches me. You know, um, yeah. Does that answer it? That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. What? I had no preconceived idea or judgment. I, I was just curious. Yeah. It's like, it's interesting. It's interesting to do a practice like that over also just like a durationally a period of days. Also, it's something like as a queer and trans person, I'm just interested in going into spaces where I've been made to feel unwelcome and then trying to open the cathedral of that, you know, and be like, I, for me, worship means a lot of different things and like the right to do that. Um, is something that I am deeply invested in everywhere, you know. Thank you. These questions make me, see, and I want to ask more questions. They make me Mike? think of stuff. Hi. Hey. I'm, Abby. I'm Michael. Nice Hi, to meet Michael. you. Um, when you were reading your poems, you have a very distinct style and musicalness to them. And I was particularly wondering if there's any process that you came to where you decided to read your poems like that, or if there was any kind of process or just decision making was going on with that, or just how you feel? Yeah, you know, um, I, part of it is that I'm, I get very nervous before to read. And so I think that there is a way in which, um, from the very beginning, I started reading without even thinking about it in a slightly different way than I speak, just because that energy had to go somewhere, right? Um, 
And I, then I really try to let, like my poems read pretty differently on the page than they do in the air, and I'm interested in that. And I try to let like the poem, this sounds a little like, but it's really true. I kind of like to let the poem teach me how to read it. This Good Friday poem, like I've only read it, I think I've read it three times, and I'm really, it's letting me, it's helping, it's, it's teaching me. But I do think that sort of, that tone that I do have, that I do find, it's not something I work on or practice or even pay much attention to, but I can feel it in my body. And one thing I'm, um, I have a lot of anxiety, and something that my mother-in-law, who is an unbelievable like energy worker and massage therapist, but other people have also said to me, when I went through a period of really profound panic, they would say, feel your feet, feel your feet. And I'd be like, well, at first I'd be like, okay, fine. And then I'd be like, I don't have feet. I can't feel my feet. You know, I just realized like I could not feel my feet. And so I think it is also a way when I read that there is something about just like trying to read from my feet up, if that makes sense, and like sounding through the whole vessel of myself. Yeah. Has anyone ever said that to you? Like feel your feet and you're like, when you're freaking out and you're like, I can feel my feet. And then you're like, actually, I don't feel anything below my neck. Hold on, yeah. It's good to feel your feet. Other questions? Other Shy. folks? What other Ooh. questions? Oh, oh. Here you go. Hi. Hi. I'm Gabby. I'm Carissa. Nice Hi. to meet you. Um, I noticed, so in one of your poems, Mary Oliver comes up, mm -hmm. and I loved how, <laughs> as you read it, we all like sort of laughed, and then you gave this knowing look like, I love Mary Oliver. Yeah. Um, and I took that, you know, like that you really love Mary Oliver, but also this like, it's not very cool to say. Um, and I was curious like if that, and, and she also just like erupts out of the poem mm -hmm. um, in an unexpected moment. So I was curious about how that came out of you in the moment of writing it. Absolutely, I love Mary Oliver, I really do. And um, she's all of a sudden like having a renaissance where all these poets are now like, I love Mary Oliver, I always love Mary Oliver. She was the greatest, let me tell you something. When she was alive and I was an editor at the Los Angeles, Los Angeles Review of Books, and even right after she died and I tried to get poets to write about Mary Oliver, nobody would write about it. I mean, literally. And what people would say is, I love her, I really do, but I can't write about her. Because, and like these were like, I mean, these are kind of like famous people who certainly could have, but like that somehow writing, saying, now, all, now everyone's like, oh, Mary Oliver, what a genius. Mary Oliver's a genius, was a genius and is, and, um, but I'm interested in that, right? Like that there was something, there was something about, I think, her level of success. I also think there's just an, was a, an astonishing amount of homophobia um, surrounding, I mean, we don't think enough of like Mary Oliver as like a queer icon, but she really was. I went to Smith and I gave this talk and I showed this like really iconic photo of Mary Oliver where like there is no question in the world, right? Um, but most of the people who were quite a bit younger had seen photos of Mary Oliver where she was really done up in a very different way and she was, it was really desexualized. And I think of Mary Oliver as someone I came up with like understanding was a, a queer figure. And so in that poem, there's also like, I mean, that's also in Provincetown and Mary Oliver was like in Provincetown. I mean, okay, here's the other thing that happened at Smith, right? Is <laughs> It's like, this is an amazing thing. I mean, um, I wish I could just like tell you the photo to search right now, but there's like, anyway. Um, it, she's standing on the, sh on the, like a dock in Provincetown and she's got all white on and her, sh and her sleeves are up and her forearms are amazing and she has these like aviator glasses. First of all, all these like younger people came up and were like, oh my God, her forearms. I was like, I know, very hot. But the other thing, <laughs> was that like there were all these like younger people coming up being like, oh, Mary Oliver, like I, I didn't know, but like I love her. And then there were all these like old lesbians who came up and were like, <clears throat> I lived in Provincetown, I can tell you all about Mary Oliver, you know? <laughs> and like, I mean, really and truly, like, and, and I'm interested in that. I'm interested in both of them, but I'm really interested in that. You know, I'm interested in the old lesbian who came to the reading in leather, like who wanted to talk to me about Mary Oliver, and because they knew Mary Oliver really well. You know, like, and I say that by way of, I had a period of time where I was also spending time with Mary Oliver, and 
I just think that she's a really important figure, but I think what's also important, right, things are mirrors, and I think Mary Oliver is also a mirror. Uh, we talked in, earlier in class about shame, and people are like, now it's getting to be okay, but people were ashamed to say they liked her, you know? Um, those poems were extraordinary, you know? And she was the real deal, you know, she used to, she, she, she would walk through the woods in Provincetown and she put pencils in all of these tree hollows so that like she would always have a pencil that she could be taking notes, right? When she wanted to know like what it was like to write like to write about a fox, she would you would like walk in, she'd be like on the, her hands and knees crawling through the forest, you know? Like that's interesting. We don't think about her like that. And so um and also someone who people like we're like, oh, I didn't know she was a lesbian, but this was a person who, like, a was like openly in a relationship with, you know, Molly Malone, her partner, for a long time, and also like the poems are lesbian. Like she's she is overtly talking at times about like having sex with women or being interested in women, and people are like, I had no idea. It's like, well, okay, you know. And so I think that yeah, I love her, I really do. And she did love the Boston Red Sox, and she did give me. Um, a baseball that said go socks, but she wrote it in just like regular pen, so it's faded and gone now. But I like that about it too. I'm like Mary Oliver. Yeah. It's interesting, like the poets that we that we feel like we can love openly and the ones that we don't, you know, and she's one of those figures. I hope there's gonna be a PBS documentary about her now and the Library of Congress is doing a big thing for her. And I hope that I hope that they do everything for her, you know, because she's really important. She's really important. What else? Any other questions? These are good questions. I'm into it. Wait, I see someone running. I don't want to run after Not I mean. things over. I might fall. That would be Hi, Bobby. Hey, Gabby. It's good um, to see you. Good to see you again. Uh, I, you talked about this a little bit in the class, but how do you deal with like keeping someone who either you like idolize or is, was a big part of your life not turning them into caricature within your poems and keeping them true to themselves and not like your perce perceived view of them. Yeah, thank you so much, Bobby. That's a great question. Um, I think it's really hard, right? I mean, I have this like central figure of my mother, for instance, who died when I was 13. She took her life. She has like a story that is both um, very dramatic when you hear it, and also the life that many, many people have had, right? Um, she's also kind of unknown to me in certain ways, and yet, you know, one might say it's the only thing I write about, even if I write about lots of other things, like that loss, that mystery. Um, it took me a really long time to understand that when I was writing the poems about her, because I was so locked into like um, her serving a purpose in my poems, right? Like her being a kind of key to a sort of trauma that I'd had, and you know, that in a way, like I was, I was being pretty extractive in terms of like her life and her experience. And so I realized at one point, like I talked all about my mother's suffering over and over and over again, but like I never allowed her to like eat a piece of pizza in a poem, you know? Like I never talked about the fact that like she really liked Dinty Moore stew. I love Dinty Moore stew. I could talk about her loving Dinty Moore stew and that's a really specific real moment between us where she's not a caricature. That also, like, if I work a little more deeply into that, it's also true that like she loved Dinty Moore stew because she'd lost all her teeth by the time she was 40 and like Dinty Moore stew is really delicious and really soft, you know, and so the answer to your question is, one of the ways I think we can work to like have people we idolize or beings we love or stories that are ours and also very much belong to someone else in our life is <clears throat> what are the ways that I can make this person like a really real person, you know? What are the, and what are the parts of the story that are mine and what aren't, you know? Like I also just, I stopped putting myself in the center of the story with her, but also sometimes I stopped putting her right at the center either, right? Like we were both just two beings and the world was around us, 
you know? And so I think that there's something about that. I think that it's also, um, I think there's also something about thinking about power a little bit and thinking about what does it mean for me to write about this person that I love so much? Even if it's like just like, oh my gosh, even with my partner, oh my gosh, she's the greatest. I write about her. She's the most amazing person. The bow tie poem is like one of the first poems I ever wrote for her that was actually like a true, felt like a real love poem to her, to, to her, right? Not to, like that she might have thought like, wow, this is a real love poem to me. And it's because like it's just us doing a thing we always do and her being a real person instead of me being like your eyes, you know, or like, I mean, right? And she's just like, who's that person you're talking? You know, I mean, so there's also something just about how human, how, how can we let, like in class say, how can we let everyone be the animal they are, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. And also really paying attention. Do you have someone that you that you love, that you write about, or that you don't love, or that a kind of figure? You don't even have to answer. Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, thank you. But I guess, I don't know, I wrote a couple poems about my past relationship, but also mm -hmm. different about my family and like connections to like myself within my family. Mm -hmm. I think that has a like, I think encapsulating memories where you don't make it more than it is is something yeah. that's very difficult for me. Yeah. And so it's hard not to like rewrite the past in that sense. Yeah, my me too. It's hard for me too. And I think one of the things is, another thing that, can ha that I've started to try and do in poems is actually just like address that, right? Like it's amazing to write a poem and in the middle of the poem, wherever you are in your memory to say, it's hard for me to write this, this, you know what I mean? Like to actually let that voice come in is pretty powerful. I think fallibility is another way that I began to be able to write about the beings I love so much or have such difficulty with or have like, in just I don't even know what is going on, to say like, wow, I don't know and let the mystery unfold as a way. My, my great teacher, Lucy Brock Broido, another ghost, used to say, in a moment like that, why not take the period out and put a question mark in? And it seems little, but it's not, right? Like, I would go back into one of those poems where you're talking about that experience, and you, you own it, and you love it, and it's so deep for you, or you hate it, it's so, and it's, it can be hard to do this. Take one moment where you have an emphatic period and turn that into a question mark and just see what happens. It's kind of revelatory and scary. Yeah. Thanks, Bobby. Is there any more questions? That was a good question, Bobby. Wow, I'm like shimmering with it. Oh, someone else? This is a beautiful space. I just want to say again, wow. Hi, I'm Gabby. Hi, I'm Kiana. Hi. Um, hi. Um, I've let me be the first to admit that as you answer some of these questions, some of um, some a, a lot of the answers you give, I'm I am having I am having a hard time like understanding how your answers connect with the with the original question in the first yeah. place, and yeah. that um, and that can and that can make me wonder. Do you um, and that can make me wonder. Do you by any chance have do you by any chance have like ADD or ADHD like I do or or yeah. um, I think one of the things that I I would I absolutely like have an associative mind right and so one of the things that I'm super struck by is like someone will ask me a question and what I'm struck by is like how many of the questions that are asked are so open ended like why did I write the thing about Lent right there's not like an easy answer to that, right? There's, there's, a, there's a kind of journey to that. Or Bobby's like unbelievable question, which is, you know, like how do you, how do you actually write about these beings that you idolize? Like how do you give them a full, a full life, right? 
the thing that I've learned more than anything in poetry is like this, there's just like there's no simple answer. Even if you said to me right now, like, how do you write a villanelle? I could tell you like the exact rules of the villanelle, but that wouldn't tell you anything about how to write a villanelle, right? And so, but it can be frustrating, right? It can also be frustrating to come and hear someone talk and be like, but I just want to know the answer. Also, like, I've made, been made to come to this for a class, or like, I have to do, like, I have other things to do with my life, you know? I think that for me, and my poems are like this too, I am someone who's always going to go the long way to get, always. But I'm also someone who, I have the, I, I am also someone who, um, I think there's a lot of answers to any single question. And I think that any time I answer a question about a poem and, and to think about poetics, I don't know if other people in this room have had this experience. I spent, I spent so much of my life in rooms where people who said, I have the answer and this is the answer and there's no other answer. There was a lot of people in my generation who did that, like our teachers. And I just like, it's also my practice not to do that. Um, but I also really love that question. I love you um, also talking about ADD and ADHD and asking that question in terms of that, because I do have a visual disability and a neurological difference called nystagmus. Um, and, and A, I wish I had been able to ask a question in a room in relation to my nystagmus when I was, I don't know how old, may I ask how old you are? Yeah, I'm 49. I, I did not begin asking questions like with that degree of specificity, and, and I think it's a brave thing to, to ask that question. I wasn't able to do that until I was like 47 years old, right? And so I also want to say, because I do think that um, my nystagmus, absolutely, and the way my eyes go back and forth, and um, there's this thing with nystagmus where I have what's called a null point and my head cocks off like this and I, it's the place where my eyes get really still and it's kind of like a trance state. And I think, I don't, I think um, maybe it's a, in terms of thinking about when you ask is, is, do I have ADD or ADHD, I have something just built into my system that makes me go off into the distance and like take a journey. And for a long time that was um, a disability that really closed down my life in a way and now it's a way in which I kind of just let myself go into that space also to answer a question. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Can we get a round of applause for, for Gabby? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, and thank you for these incredible questions. And I really look forward. We've got a big, long, um, wonderful workshop, five hours tomorrow. I'm super psyched. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone so much. I hope you have a beautiful night. It's still light out. Gabby, do you want to sign some books? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's sign some books. And say